Happy Thursday. Welcome. Hope I'm not too loud. I feel like I hear myself in my inner ear right now. <laughs> technology. So this is the class on uh, technology population, Esther Boser up and some other folks who we'll talk about in a bit. <laughs> you ever have that sense when you're on a video conference and you hear your own echo in the phone or something like that? I'm getting that sensation right now. Maybe if I put this down there, it's a little bit better. Can you guys still hear me in the back? Not sure? Well, let's give this a shot. Okay. So Lab 4 will be due on Friday, February 21st, not on Wednesday, February 19th. And we will update the calendar to show that. And I also wanted to go over some, uh, some notes about the solo model that I think uh, hopefully could clear up some confusion, which, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential confusion in the solo model. Uh, not least of which I think because many of you have seen the solo model in other classes or seen other growth models in other classes, and it gets confusing when there are different people talking about, you know, similar models or maybe even the same model, but the model can often have these tiny idiosyncrasies that are presented or not. It's a tough call, really, to, you know, what are the salient features of things for me or the GSIs to talk about in, in class or in section. So we're always trying to sort of pick through that as carefully as we can. One thing I wanted to mention was that there's a, a, a big distinction between the capital output ratio, which is big K over big Y in, in the math, and that's a number that's something like four for the United States. And then there's the capital share, and uh, you know, the problem here is just the semantics are what they are. That capital share typically means the share of all income, which is equal to output, and that's probably where the confusion comes from. It's the share of all income that is paid to capital, uh, but the payment rate or the price of capital is the interest rate or the marginal product of capital. It's a little, little r. So these are obviously related. You know, the capital output ratio times the interest rate equals the capital share then, but they are different and distinct, and of course the numbers are different too. So we'll usually see something like this, that the capital uh, share is a number like a third, or 33%, or it could be higher. I think it was 40% in lab three. Uh, it's, it's also the exponent in the Cobb-Douglas production function. Um, and, you know, the relationship is that, you know, there's the interest rate here that multiplies things, and it's, you, you, it's the gross interest rate, so it's not net of depreciation. So you could think of the, maybe the net, depre net interest rate maybe as being 5%, like it is in the Piketty reading. Maybe the gross number is 8.25, and that's what you would find. So 8.25 times 4 gets you a number like 0 0.33. Um, so that's kind of how all those fit together. Uh, and I'm just going to say a few more things about it, but if, if things aren't clear, please do go ahead and stop me and ask me to explain it. So when the production function is Cobb-Douglas, so it has this form in, in, in levels. So the level of output is equal to the level of technology or productivity times the capital uh, stock, the level of the capital stock to the power of some number alpha. So maybe alpha is 0.4 or 0.33 or something times the amount of labor as the stock of labor, the number of people were working uh, to the power of one minus alpha. So notice that the magic here is that these two things sum to unity and that, that's constant returns to scale and the physical inputs there. If, so it turns out if this is mathematically true, then it's, the economy is forced to have a constant capital share of income. It's always this exponent alpha that goes to capital and one minus alpha goes to labor always. And Piketty and Size point out that in real economies, you know, uh, it, it, it's, this is just a toy model. A real economy could be very different than that. Uh, and it turns out that it, it looks like the capital share has been doing something interesting uh, recently. And they say, well, maybe it's because the capital share actually rises with capital deepening. So what's the upshot? What, what does that mean? Well, if the capital share is constant, uh, at least the Horrible wealthy capitalists are not getting rich any more quickly than they were. I don't know. If the capital share rises, that means that more of output gets paid to capital. So it kind of worsens this challenge of 
concentrated wealth ownership. That's one way of thinking about it. So, so they, they raise this as this flag. It's like, well, we don't know that the capital share is constant. It might well not be constant at all. And if you look at uh, studies that, that try to measure this, and it's not easy to measure, uh, here's, uh, and the, the, the light blue there is actual hyperlink if you're so inclined to click through and look at the whole study. This is a measure of one minus the capital share or the labor share of output, which had been hovering around two thirds, sort of, certainly in the immediate post-war, maybe slightly lower here, and then it really appears to have kind of fallen off a cliff down to more like uh, 58, 57% down here in the last, uh, say, decade or two. Um, it, precisely what has happened, I think, is beyond anybody's ken at this point. We don't really know, but what we do know is that this isn't necessarily just a fixed parameter like in physics. I always kind of get a kick out of it. I mean, you know, a physicist will tell you that Newtonian physics is also actually not fixed, right? There's the general theory of relativity that sort of throws everything up in the air also. Uh, but so maybe that's a good parallel. Economics is kind of like Newtonian physics, except when it isn't. And suddenly things are a little bit different, and we don't know precisely why this is happening. So let me pause there before I go on a, a little bit further with the solo stuff. Any questions? capitalists. I mean, in, in theory, right, there's no particularly bad thing for capital getting paid its marginal product, and if it's higher, it's higher, whatever, you know, that, that could happen. Um, but it, the, I mean, the problem is that, well, a couple of things. One is, is that Piketty and Size show that through randomness, you might end up with an unequal distribution. Things are not known with, with certainty. So if you invest something in the stock market, you might see your money go up or down. Um, if you take a job at, at Google, chances are you're probably going to be okay. But if you leave Google and take a job at a startup, you might well make it rich, or you might well find yourself in the poorhouse, you know, relatively speaking, but probably not in the actual poorhouse, but not doing that great. So you know, your, your startup could work really well or not. There's a randomness. And so what Piketty and Size point out is that randomness then could produce inequality over time uh, through the mathematical nature of it all. Um, so that, that's a challenge. And the other challenge, too, is that, you know, it, it's not as if everybody is the same. We're not identical. One dimension in which that's rather obvious is that everybody's different in terms of their age. You know, us in this room, maybe you guys not so much. I'm, of course, a lot older than you, about twice your age. Uh, and if you look at the United States, of course, people are all different ages, and that there alone gives you some inequality. Older folks... Uh, have been around longer, have worked, and maybe have retired, and maybe have saved, uh, and then they are owners of capital. But beyond that, of course, there is a big difference between the people who went to Google back when it started up, <laughs> this huge pile of cash, or they left Google and started a startup and decided to retire being a billionaire at age 40 or whatever it was. I mean, that can happen, and that's different from college professors who don't make a lot of money, like I don't make a ton of money, but... I make a ton of happiness, to be honest. And they, I don't know, they, they do too, I guess. I really have, have no idea. That's kind of the million dollar question, right? It's like, how happy are you uh, doing what? And it's, you know, probably people do sort in some regard that way, uh, but money probably also makes one happier. Uh, I know I certainly wouldn't mind more of it. So the, the you know, what does it matter? Well, it, it's because the wealth uh, is not held equally. Uh, it's not as if everybody has the same share in the nation's capital stock. It's, it's held by a few folks who, you know, like Michael Bloomberg, who can just wait and start running for president and spend a whole bunch of money and they don't really care. Uh, you know, that, yeah, <laughs> there it is. Uh, okay. The marginal product of capital, and I think this was made clearer maybe in the problem set uh, in the lab than, than it has been in class. I just wanted to mention this, that it's maybe not that obvious, but it's, it's the slope of the tangent line on the production function at the level of uh, the capital output ratio, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, at the level of little k, the capital labor ratio. So it's the slope of this tangent line drawn here uh, to the production function per worker technically, but it turns out that you know, if you run the chain rule, you will find that this is true, that, that the, technically this is the marginal product of capital. It's the partial derivative of, of the output function with respect to, to big K. And it's actually also equal to little y uh, partial with respect to little k or f prime of k, this single, single variable uh, function that we've transformed it into. 
So a decent amount of mileage then can be gotten by you guys by thinking about how this marginal product of capital changes when little k changes, when, when it increases or when it decreases. And there, you know, it's fairly straightforward. It, it kind of, you know, goes one way or the other. Um, the, you know, the farther up the ski slope you get back up here, uh, the flatter it gets. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's sort of ironic, right? Because the bunny hill is usually down here at the bottom of the ski slope. But here is the, the reverse, you know, up here is the flat part and down here is the very scary black diamond part. Um, so the, there are higher rates of return uh, to capital down here when capital is relatively scarce and smaller rates of return up here where, when capital is quite plentiful. And then so this was in the slides last time. We didn't get to it. Uh, I tried to up, add a little bit of notation to it. So now, of course, it's a ton of notation that might be even more confusing than before. I, I hope not. Um, Here's the slope of the tangent line, and the slope of that is the marginal product of capital. So you could think of it as the interest rate. And it turns out that uh, this, this green distance here, which is the, uh, the difference between the level of output per worker, that's you know, the total distance here, the green plus the orange. The green is the, 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 the total output per worker minus the part that gets paid to capital. And how does one think about where this comes from? Well, this is a triangle. And this is the, uh, we've got the slope of this guy, and the rise is given by this, and this is the run, and so the, the slope of this is the rise over the run. So if you multiply it by the run, you get just the rise back. And so that's, that's how this works in that way. So you can, you can visualize the wage here as being this green distance. The wage, as k gets pushed out to the, to the right, the wage also rises. And that makes sense. Uh, what we're doing is increasing capital per worker. And that means that workers become more productive. They have more capital goods to work with. You give them more, com more computers and more uh, Instagram accounts and I don't know what makes us productive. <laughs> Usually not the internet, right? <laughs> Other things do. Uh, more trucks and more cars and more robots to help us in our production. We become more productive, our wage rises. So I suspect many of you grappled with this uh, on the problem set, on the lab rather. You've seen it in other classes probably, but I did want to just walk through it. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the solo model. Uh, the other thing that, that we'll get into later that maybe I haven't diagrammed out as much is that underneath all this are um, the same demand curves for labor. Uh, that's the one we usually look at, the labor demand curve. There's a downward sloping labor demand curve. Uh, and there's also a downward sloping capital demand curve, if you wanted to think about that here, um, underneath all this. And uh, the labor demand curve will tell you what the wage is. So will this analysis, uh, just looking at the, the tangent line brought back to the, the y-axis here, and so that's the, this vertical distance is actually the wage. Um, and you could think of this as going hand in hand then with a, a traditional supply and demand diagram where we've got a downward sloping labor demand curve and some kind of supply of labor, which turns out to be inelastic, so it's vertical. All these pieces are all floating around all together there, uh, but it's a real challenge, I think, sometimes to, to think of them all. Questions? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. Yeah, so let, let me try to summarize. A lot of people complain about income inequality, and by that I, I think you're talking about labor income inequality or wage inequality, people working in Silicon Valley. And Piketty and Size talk about capital income inequality or wealth holding inequality. Yeah. And th these are both uh, really salient points. And I think for the United States today, the more pressing issue really is actually labor income inequality. And so that, that's, I think, true, that it, that's more important. And it, it's, it's kind of a side note in the Piketty and Size reading. I think I put the page number in the notes from last time about where it appears. It's not their headline. And it's because they don't have a lot to say about it, even though it's kind of empirically the most important part of US labor income and income inequality. It's not actually driving from capital. Uh, I think it, you know, and this is unfortunate because, you know, there, there are all these plans, right, from the presidential candidates to tax uh, billionaires. 
Well, that might work, but what that really is is a story about a wealth tax, and it doesn't seem like that's actually the root issue in this country. But it does seem like maybe it's more of the issue in Europe. And the open question, I have no knowledge about this, is to what extent it's the issue perhaps in places like China or Brazil or other uh, rapidly developing countries. Other questions? Okay, so today, uh, the pull and push of technology and population, and if you are confused by the, the two different, uh, what, verbs, nouns, pull and push, what in the world do those two things mean and why, and I get confused all the time about that, so hopefully we can clarify that. Two kinds of technological change, new ideas and new uses of old ideas, and so those are, those are you know, important to draw the distinction um, to be honest there too, I guess the learning objective is a little bit lost on me on the second point. It's true and it's in the reading uh, and it's absolutely salient if one were looking at technological development in history or in developing countries today. Um, but I, I think it's kind of an academic point to be honest and I, I can't think of a good exam question that might draw from that. But maybe. Maybe I just haven't thought about it enough. We'll, we'll have fun pictures about agricultural intensification, which is an example of, I think, mostly the new uses of old ideas. It's the, the, the idea that you can, you know, depending on, on what the local demands of the market might be, depending on how many people there are in the market and how much food they demand, you could use different levels of intensity. So effectively the same technology, but you're just doing different techniques uh, to, to farm either more or less intensively. And it's a function then of, of how, much, how much population there is. And that's kind of the point, that technology can be viewed as a function of population rather than the reverse. Paths to invention, uh, ideal path of population growth, we'll have a little bit to say about. Uh, but one of the, the key things that I'm really looking forward to talking a little bit about is the Nobel lecture from last uh, December 2018, so a year and two months ago. Uh, where I, I was just floored by this. We've got a link to the, the video, which is up on YouTube, and you can watch it if you like. There was a shout out to our own Professor Emeritus Ron Lee, who used to teach this course in the Nobel Lecture, which is kind of cool, all about this topic of historical uh, change in technology, uh, techniques in agriculture, and historical population growth. So before we get there, why don't we do a, an iClicker question uh, up front, just in case people are here for the eye clicker and then they're going to leave quickly. <laughs> and that's okay. If you're having a problem with your eye clicker, go ahead and, and do this. Um, so press and hold your power button down for two seconds and press A, then A. So most of you don't have to worry about this. I think there was one student who said uh, their eye clicker wasn't working. Uh, if that's you, try doing this. And that should sync you up with this base station. Okay, so hold the power button down for two seconds and then press A, then A. So now I'm going to take this away and I hope, there we go. Okay, uh, so what happens in the short run if the annual rate of immigration is cut in half? So we're talking about the rate of immigration, not a one-time uh, amount of immigrants, but a rate of immigration. And here in the United States, the, the annual rate of immigration is something on the order of uh, maybe a quarter of a percent of the population growth rate. In the short run, what happens? Um, immigrants do not bring capital or technology and they're otherwise identical to natives. Okay, so let's uh, close polling in three, two, one. Let's close the poll. Okay, so uh, short run and long run are kind of tough in the solo model. Let's start with the, at the top. What, what does the scenario suggest that you do? It suggests that you that you decrease uh, the annual rate of, of immigration, which it decreases the population growth rate. So if the population growth rate falls, uh, then we're going to see a pivoting clockwise of this red line, right? It gets flatter because the slope falls. In the short run, what happens? So it's kind of a trick question because the answer is uh, nothing to capital and output per worker because capital is still the same 
level, in the short run, we're just talking about a rate of change that's altering. So the best answer here is C in the short run, and let's see how we did. Okay, so, I th you know, it's, it's a short run, long run kind of problem here, right? Yeah. Uh, if the rate of immigration were to fall, then in the short run, we're still at K star, because the red line is pivoted clockwise, so we've got a slower rate of population growth. In the short run, uh, nothing changes in the levels of these things. Kind of a tough one, isn't it, in the short run? Um, so I think you know, most folks answered A, um, and that would be the answer to this one, isn't it? <laughs> so, so let me go ahead and open polling just in case you arrived later, didn't get a click on the first one. Go ahead and have a click. Uh, in the long run, what happens if this same, the same scenario plays out? Immigration is cut in half. Immigrants do not bring capital technology, otherwise identical to natives. What happens in the long run? Again, the red curve pivots downward. Um, and uh, what does that do to capital and output per worker in the long run? So I've already said the answer, so let's close polling in three, two, one. Close polling, and let's pull that up, and so the answer is A. That's right. Okay. Trickery. It's when in doubt, ask a question. Um, again, we, we hope to make exam questions not nearly this sort of fiendishly, you know, 100% right or 100% wrong, that there'll be space for uh, partial credit. Um, questions, yes? Yes. So let me paraphrase what, what we said. Then, So if the population growth rate falls, doesn't the red curve pivot flatter or, or clockwise? And thus, doesn't that create a new capital per worker, uh, a steady state capital per worker that, that's, that's to the right, that's greater than K star? And the answer is yes, exactly. That's where you end up in the long run. Yeah. So it's the correct answer for this one. It's not the correct answer for the short one. I think I think this is the first question. Yes. Yes, and let me repeat that for everybody. So would it be different if there were a sudden one-time change in immigration versus a change in the rate of immigration? Wouldn't that be different? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's right. That's, that's, yeah, that's why this is tricky and unfair. Um, yeah, I, I want to say more about this scenario in a second, but so there had been another question. I, okay, yeah. How would that look using the graph? Is that just be movement along the curve? Oh, that's a really good question. How would it look using the graph? Would it be movement along the curve or what? And so I have to ask you, do you mean this question or do you mean her question? So I, so I think you mean, let's talk about this scenario, right? So what she just said is suppose we had a one-time shock of immigration, a, like a boatload of people who show up. And I'm asking you, do you mean that or do you mean this when I'm talking about a change in the rate of immigration? You're pointing to this, so this one. So is, yeah, does the scenario result in a, in, a, uh, in a shift of the curve or a movement along the curve or both or what? And the answer is you should think of it as a shift in the curve. It's a pivoting of this red curve clockwise, or flattening of it. So a story about the population growth rate will show up as a change in this curve somehow. The population growth rate falls, that means that this thing pivots this way. It gets less steep because this is the slope. So the curve will shift, pivots downward. Um, in the short run, we're gonna be at this same K star but the red curve having pivoted down means that the intersection of it will be down here. So there's, there's uh, a greater amount of saving there. The, the green curve will be above the new red curve, which I haven't drawn, but you can imagine it being here. And then gradual movement toward this higher K star to the right. Okay, so, so why did I trick you all? Right, I'm 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 really not a sadist. I'm not. The reason, <laughs> the reason I introduced this is this is actually lurking behind the scenes. This is the administration's desired policy for U.S. immigration. It is not. I mean, 
think, think of it as you, as you will. It is true that ICE is deporting people all the time. But they do not have in their heads mass deportation of some of the 11 million unauthorized immigrants who are living in the United States. Even if you could think about how to do that, that would be extremely costly to do it, and it would be probably completely infeasible because ICE doesn't have that many agents. So what the Trump administration seems to be, to be focused more on in a subtle way is this policy. Now, end of the day, it, it kind of has the same, well, what? I mean, I guess, so I don't want to complicate this too much. End of the day, you can see why perhaps one might be in favor of a policy like that, of reducing the level, and they're really talking about authorized immigration or total immigration, whatever you like, either the, the total unauthorized and, and authorized immigration rates or just the total authorized, you know, legal immigration, you know, people getting, I think they're also thinking about green cards, but, you know, the naturalization rates and things like that, actually reducing that. Um, well, why might you be in favor of that? You might be in favor of it because it turns out it would, in this simple model, raise income per person and capital per person, everything else constant. But it requires that you assume the solo model with immigrants not bringing capital and immigrants not contributing to anything other than, than saving. So they save at the same rate as natives and they don't contribute to technology. Other questions? What, what if immigrants bring capital? Well, uh, it depends how much capital they bring. And that was one of the questions on the lab. So you could imagine a couple of different stories there, but if they bring exactly the same amount of capital as, as everybody else, then it doesn't affect really anything. Immigrants could come or not come or whatever, and nothing changes, because they, they themselves have the same ratio of capital to labor as the natives do. So you're not really doing anything at all by adding or subtracting immigrants. And that's what this simple stylized model tells you. And you should be kind of appalled by that because of course it matters whether they're immigrants or not. And that's kind of the punchline of, of sort of the rest of today's talk. People matter, so it's kind of ridiculous to imagine that they wouldn't. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, so I apologize for, for the trickery. At least there's an, you know, there's an upside to it there. We all got to have a conversation about it and think about, you know, sort of, you know, what goes into all this. And, you know, I, ideally right down the line, all this uh, sort of brain gymnastics results in our thinking critically about actual things that really matter in, in the real world, like, like administration policies and Congress and immigration policy and all that. And, you know, you and I, not so much the retirees, uh, but you and I will be forced to reckon with all of that at some point if we can ever figure out some way of moving forward. I mean, um, you know, to some extent, of course, I, I think what's happening is states are kind of making immigration policy on their own, even though they're not supposed to technically. And in some sense, they don't. But in some sense, they, they kind of do with, with um, what are, you know, the term is called sanctuary cities. Uh, for, for better or for worse, that's the term that is used, and it's, it's kind of a big deal in uh, most parts of the United States. Okay. Okay. Oh, I apologize. I took out the, uh, I left in the, the clicks in here. So <laughs> let's talk about technology. Uh, two things to say about, about technology here is that there actually is growth in technology over time, of course. And so that's something that Malthus never saw. Uh, but the other big question is, what actually incentivizes technological innovation? Why does, what, does it happen, and what causes it? And boy, can we figure out how to, how to harness it, right, if we knew what actually caused it? And, you know, there are short answers, and then there are longer answers, but we're going to start on this. So we're going to call uh, the first perspective uh, that, you know, if new technology just falls out of the sky, technology is manna from heaven or some deity just bestows it upon humanity, then technology pulls population along. It, it pushes out a, a labor demand curve. It allows uh, there to be more population without uh, some Malthusian death trap kind of thing. But the second perspective is that arguably, it, it, you know, these things don't happen because of some divine law, right? That's just silly. It's, it's, it's people who actually are spending time to come up with ideas test them out, 
And of course, a big part of the story is actually talking to other people about these ideas and rigorously testing these things out, uh, conducting experiments, uh, you know, and you kind of need other people around to be able to do that sort of thing. You, you, you could try it on your own, but you probably would end up <laughs> with a lot of, of error and not in, in all of your trials. Okay. I'm sorry about the timing of all these <laughs> bullets. I missed it all, mixed it all up. Uh, must it all up, uh, mixed it all up, did all kinds of things. Uh, Manna from Heaven. So classical economists like Adam Smith, uh, writing around the time of Malthus at the same time, uh, knew that technology was important. Traditionally, they saw it as, as exogenous. Maybe it was just a function of time, of humanity on the earth. People would just think of new things because they're alive or become some supreme deity just might see fit to bestow. And there's a funny parallel here that we'll see as we get to the very end of the slides today. Um, you know, what, what does grant us, uh, you know, insight? Well, I think the, the tendency there is to think about some of these old religious texts as actually representing the time spent ruminating on things and thinking about things. And, of course, in the medieval period and earlier, a lot of the thought was happening in, at the monasteries and other places where uh, people managed to kind of escape the awful, you know, dog-eat-dog -dog world of the medieval period. But is it really the word of God or anything else that, that, that pushes all this? And it's, well, mm, okay. But the funny thing is that a lot of the language that describes the period that we have now called the Enlightenment actually discusses it as coming from some all-powerful all deity, which is kind of the funny thing. It doesn't, right? It comes from people. It comes from people talking about, if, the, if you like religious stuff, you know, uh, but it, it's not just appearing because of some... I don't know, video game boss or something saying, all right, here we go, Mario, I'm going, I'm Bowser, I'm going to give you an idea to do something. No, it's just silly. Um, so we can see this, this dynamic described in classical economics within the Malthusian model as a labor demand curve that shifted outward. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the history that we're talking about. Up to 1800 or so, and things start getting pretty interesting after that, but originally what we were talking about with human history was a hunter-gatherer period, pretty much... Uh, requires some skills, but not a huge amount of organization. Uh, then 10 to 12,000 years ago, what's called the Neolithic Revolution, or Agricultural Revolution, produced agriculture and fixed settlement. One of the interesting questions is exactly why this happened. There was climatic change, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, and then probably the next major advance was the Industrial Revolution quite a bit later. Um, pro yeah, well... Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, I guess the scientific thinking that happened a little bit before the Industrial Revolution, just getting around the time, going at the time of Adam Smith and Thomas Malthus. <clears throat> and now, so the nuclear power revolution that we're in, maybe the information age, and we're not exactly sure. It's always much easier to talk about things in the distant history. Uh, and we view each of these as shifting out labor demand. So that's the story. Uh, we have a Malthus model underneath it all, and each of these shelves is some big outward shift of labor demand through this uh, technology parameter that just helps everyone. What that would ultimately do, if you believe the Malthus model, is in the long run, you'd still be subject to this same iron law of wages. So W star would still be the, the equilibrium, um, but you know, if these were large enough shifts that it took a long time to ever reach this much higher shelf of population, you'd at least have improved uh, living standards and the wage in the short run. And maybe the short run lasts a very long time. So this is what you might see then, and this is based on a graphic um, that showed up in 1960 in Scientific American by this uh, ecologist uh, named, named Devi. That here's a time scale, and here's the population growing across these big jumps. And that could be what you would see. Um, and it's, again, kind of from this perspective of, well, you know, stuff happens, and it sort of pulls along population. Technology pulls along population. The alternative here is the Bozeropian view. My apologies. So I, I did actually go to Kaiser, and I'm totally clean. <laughs> it's just a really bad cold. So you're not in danger of being infected by of anything, of, by anything uh, from me, luckily. But it's been a struggle, <laughs> as many of you probably know all too well this spring. 
Okay, so the new view then is rather population is, is, is pushing technology. Um, and so in this perspective then, Bozerup is in this, this view of which maybe population is kind of exogenously given, uh, just like it is in Solo, but also the technology in Solo was exogenous. Here's Bozerup in, in a new perspective here that maybe technology is endogenously driven by the population which might be exogenous. And then the population of being endogenous, but tech and exogenous here with the Malthus model. And then there's a, a fourth class here, which we'll talk about more as the, as the class goes on, what are called endogenous growth models. Uh, Michael Creamer, who was part of uh, the Nobel Prize this year, so awarded in, awarded in, in, in December 2019, along with Esther Duflo of MIT, and also Ab Ab Abhijit Banerjee, I think is his name. I'm, I'm not entirely sure I'm pronouncing any of those correctly. But there were three prize winners this year. Michael Kramer was one of them. Uh, and these are all extremely amazing, productive people. Uh, this year awarded for folks uh, who were doing field research in developing countries uh, more than kind of the, the big view of sort of population change, which is what this earlier work of his was. And we'll talk more about that later. And then also Paul Romer, who was one of the two uh, prize winners in 2018, and also Oded Galore and David Weil, two researchers at Brown University, but this paper in 2000 that was really nice. Okay. So the basics here are that, you know, Bosser doesn't really think about what population change, uh, where it comes from. It's just a natural tendency for growth. She views that uh, the hardship in, in historical Europe that Malthus was writing about and seeing the struggle between, uh, you know, a birth and a death curve and all that, she basically sees it as, is really just the result of these exogenous factors like war and plague, natural disasters, not any kind of overpopulation. I think you could argue that she doesn't really think there's much sense in that, in that term of overpopulation because she views technology as something that adapts to what the, the population requires uh, in, in markets, for example. So population uh, increase drives agricultural, now agricultural technological change. And there's this distinction between intensification and invention, which, which is, again, I, you know, I, I call it sort of an academic one. I, I'm, I'm sticking to it, but it's, it's useful to talk about it. Um, so how does population size drive technology? Well, you can think sort of in a qualitative way here that, that maybe that's what we mean. The intensification is not really new ideas per se. It's just different applications, new applications of these things. And so the Malakoff reading, which was the second one for today, I thought described a very useful way of viewing this. You know, suppose a farmer weeds a field just once during the growing season, and the farmer stops because more weeding would have been useful, but it's very costly in terms of time. So the weeding is the technique. It's part of sort of the technological set that is available. When population rises, there are more hands to help weed and, and of course, presumably do other things. So you have to have some kind of division of labor and specialization here. It can't just be that this farmer is, is duplicated um, and somehow magically gets services from a mirror image farmer. It's got to be a different type of person who, say, helps with the weeding, but also helps maybe dig a ditch, helps build a barn or something like that. So along comes this additional pair of hands and maybe another pair of hands after that. And so the farmer decides to maybe weed three times per season. Uh, and, and maybe then finds that uh, the, the farm produces enough to set aside a little bit and pay workers to help uh, build, dig a ditch or, or you know, build a, a silo or something like that. So the point is that th this looks different, but it's really the same techniques that are just arrayed in sort of a different way. So that's one way in which humans adapt, basically. Well, you, know, you could view it that way. Humans are adaptable creatures. But another sense, of course, is that there might be some kind of uh, technological breakthrough. So some sticks are better than others. Some stones are better than others. Sticks and stones break your bones. But you know the, the whole thing about the, the Neolithic uh, era that derives from this notion of, of what happened during the Stone Age to the technology that humans managed to develop, namely stone tools, prior to metallurgy and figuring out you know copper and iron and, and finally steel and all those things, you have to, you know, <clears throat> none of this stuff is made out of stone, right? <laughs> Just as an aside, have you guys seen the new building? on Telegraph and Haste. Have you seen that thing? That is so awesome. <laughs> I, 
I, I put a picture up of that up on my Twitter feed, and that, I got like 30 hits of it. It was awesome. It's like the most the most exciting thing I've ever put on Twitter it was a picture of that building. I went to Mezzo yesterday, took a picture of that building. So Stone, we don't see Stone that much anymore, unless you're you know on Telegraph. And so, so you guys, you know, a lot of you live probably right near there, so you see it all the time now. And, it's another aside. So, but so you should feel a little lucky though. That, for 25 years, that thing was just a big open lot, and it was weird and sad. And you guys are here, and they're actually building something. So it's loud. That, that's sort of a pain. But at least there's something there. It's really depressing when it's just an open lot that was just fenced off, and, and just it was crazy. Okay. So different different sticks, different stones, different metals, things like that. Um, and that's, that's kind of the deal. Uh, so the right-hand side is, is this kind of shift in technology. Developments that actually you know, push up some kind of uh, locus here between total output and the available labor. Uh, on the left-hand side is just kind of a, a story more about a movement along the curve. Suppose you just happen to have more people. You would figure out different ways of using the techniques that you have in some more productive way. Notice, though, that you know, this is kind of on the left is a story about you know, decreasing returns. Right? The thing sort of flattens out. So even though you're going from hunting, hunting and gathering to forest fallow to short fallow, it's, it's a story about how often you, you, you know, let the field sit versus you know, till it and get back in there and make it nutrient rich and all that. So all these things are useful, but the problem is that they're, they're, you know, you've encountered these diminishing returns. It, it's always useful. You'll always be able to in, increase output per acre of the land, but you know, it's, you're sort of fighting a, a losing battle to some extent. Here, this story is about you know, figuring out brand new kinds of things that actually advance you. Like, uh, you know, obviously the internal combustion engine was a huge one because as soon as you get a tractor that you can put gasoline into, that just saves a ton, right? And so now you can just yourself you know, till the entire field. You could till you know, 10 football fields over a week or something like that. It's just an amazing uh, jump in technology. That's the thing on the right-hand side. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about agricultural intensification. It's just uh, more knowledge that you may ever have, may ever have heard about being a farmer. I, I, even though I, so I actually grew up in one of the Great Plains states, but I've never known anything about farming because most of us don't. Um, and that's a testament, of course, to just how productive we have gotten in farming. The you know the labor force engaged in farming is probably something like one percent at most of the U.S. labor force now, and they feed all of us. I mean that's just amazing, isn't it? That's how productive farmers are. So from least uh, intense to most intense, these are the sorts of things you might see. Gathering, you just sort of pick stuff up that doesn't kill you, hopefully. And you, you might talk to people about which things kill you, right? That's pretty important. Forest fallow, bush fallow, short fallow, all these stories about kind of how often you leave a field aside to let it you know, regenerate and become nutrient rich versus sort of injecting things back in there. Uh, so why do you fallow something? Well, you, you, you could do it also with flame, it turns out, which, of course, is this problem if you're worried about the carbon dioxide emissions, and we are, especially today. Um, it gets nutrients back into the land. Uh, how many people are native Californians? And may, okay, so maybe a third of the class. California is an amazingly nutrient-rich place. Not many other places on Earth are quite like this. Uh, and I'm always surprised at how much stuff grows here. But uh, if you notice somebody next to you who did not raise their hand, ask them what it's like to, to, to try to get something to grow outside. It's, not, it's really not impossible in other states, but it's harder, for sure. California is an amazing place. Okay. Okay, so these are some fun slides just kind of showing you the story about some of this. Uh, here's a very low density kind of story about gardening, easy access to forest for hunting and gathering. I think this is a tree stump. I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a neat way of looking at it all, I guess. Slash and burn agriculture. And so uh, you don't clear logs, you let the weeds and bushes grow, and you might burn it all. And that actually returns uh, nutrients to the soil. But, of course, the problem is that in the era of global, war global warming, it, it's, it produces this big externality that's, that's a bit of, of a pain for everybody else. Multi-cropping. Um, you could have rice and several other plants, and you might be able then, to, when you do that, to work the same land 
year round and get multiple harvests. And it makes uh, labor and capital investments more worthwhile when you're able to do this sort of thing. So this is a, 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 new, a new technique that you could use on the same uh, set of land. And, and what you would choose would probably be a function of the size of the agricultural market that you're selling to as a farmer. And the size of the agricultural market, meaning you know how many hungry mouths are there, uh, depends on you know the kind of the quality of the market, but the people who are in it, right? The demanders for food who are there, uh, and then finally maybe the intensive rice agriculture. And so we've seen pictures like this, the the terracing, and you'd have to spend a lot of time doing this sort of thing. So you know if you don't have flat land, and of course where I grew up, a lot of land actually was rather flat in the center of the United States. But in many other places in the world, you don't have flat land, and you need to terrace it in order to, to get some flatness and, and a better uh, growing area there. Um, you can get a lot from the land, but you need very high population density to actually justify doing this sort of thing. So what, what are the points of these last several slides? These are all fairly tried and true, I don't want to say primitive, but, but long known agricultural techniques. These are not... Um, Monsanto agribusiness chemical and you know <laughs> genetic mutations of, of 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 biomatter right it's not it's not lab science it's not rocket science it's fairly basic things but the different array of these can be chosen depending on what the needs are depending on what the market looks like and so that was Bozerup's point people are smart they use the technique that they need. Uh, you know, to, to bring their product to market and actually sell it all and make a profit. Okay. What drives invention? Um, necessity is one thing. So if you have more people around, you might find that you need to figure out ways of feeding them more efficiently. The more geniuses theory. If you have more people around, you might just on average have more geniuses. So it... <laughs> It's true, and being a parent of young kids, I'm very aware of this, right, that we all believe that actually it's important to read to your children and all that, and it is. But I'm, I'm absolutely under no, you know, uh, I, I, I don't believe that by reading to my child I'm going to make them into a Nobel Prize winner, right? <laughs> it could happen. A reasonable way of looking at this is that it's kind of totally random, you know, except then for the obvious things, right, that a lot of Nobel Prize winners are white and male, and it's because they're sort of privileged. So there is that side of it, but a lot of it is just random chance. You know? and, and another thing to say about Nobel Prize winners, and this, this kind of comes up in a way later, but not so clearly, many Nobel Prize winners who are American or from the United States are actually immigrants, meaning that they're not, you know, they're from another country, or they're second generation immigrants, you know, their parents were immigrants. People, right? People matter, and we don't really know a ton about what creates really good ideas other than the fact that people come up with them. And, of course, we need to be good parents and read to our kids and turn off the cartoons and all that stuff. It's true. Okay. So Bozerup talks about this, and it's, it's this urbanization thing, which will come up a bit later when we talk a little bit about, about Paul Romer and the Nobel Prize and his work. Um, so higher density, higher population density creates economies of scale, or at least the conditions for them, provide that you have other, other things. And it, you know, underneath all this, I think, which is not said by Bozera, and it would, 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 I think, be said by Paul Romer, who we'll see in, in a bit, but I think Bozera would agree. In order to have all these things, you have to have good government. Number one, the rule of law, rights, security. You've got to have all those things. And if you think about cross-country income differences today, that's actually a pretty big part of the story. Countries that are struggling usually are the ones that have governments that are also really struggling. And you know, there's a lot more to be said about that. But you kind of have to have all that then for population density to trigger all these other things, right? You have to have some property rights, that people actually have ownership over stuff so they care about it and people can't steal other people's stuff and all that to get away with it. Because if you do, it's, it's, it's big trouble, right? <laughs> so cities demand food produced in the country, which is kind of this interesting twist. Cities are important for development. They also bring us population density. They bring us magical, beautiful places like Berkeley, California, right? This is a, you know, an urban area that developed here. For some time, actually, the 
thought was that Berkeley might be the, the state capital. It's part of the reason why in North Berkeley, a lot of the names of the streets are the county names in, in California. So that ended up, of course, not being here. It's up in Sacramento. But uh, you know, we benefit from this, this urban area that we're in, and the exchange of ideas here is just crazy when you think about it. The number, number of Nobel laureates who are here in all the different fields, just mind-boggling. So the, the urbanization thing matters a ton, and she writes about that, and, and there's a lot to be said. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the course when we talk about in, within country migration from urban to, to uh, or rather from rural to urban areas. This is a big story in a lot of developing countries today, uh, which I, I don't have a lot of specifics to share with you about, but uh, uh, Paul Romer talks about it and we'll get there in a second. Um, so in the city, you've got these economies of scale, you've got more robust markets. In the country, you also need access to markets and transportation, some infrastructure, things like roads or rails or or waterways, anything to transport goods and, of course, in a secure fashion. So you have to be able to transport goods so that they don't, you know, they're not destroyed, they're not stolen, uh, you know, keep them in good shape so you can transport them somewhere, give them to somebody else for a, 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 a fee, and that's the whole point about the gains from trade and specialization. Rural areas are very important because they produce the food, traditionally. Uh, of course, I mean, these days, <laughs> I was looking at this picture. Our, our, our daycare provider used to have uh, chickens in her backyard <laughs> here, right, in, 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 you know, fairly urban El Cerrito. And that's kind of one of the big movements these days. You can, you can do that, but, you know, goodness knows that you're not going to be able to feed a ton of people from your backyard, uh, from your backyard garden or your chicken coops and things like that. And also, heaven help you and your neighbors if you accidentally get a rooster, right? Roosters in urban areas are, are kind of no, no fun. All right, so now this leads us to endogenous growth theory of the 1990s. And so Paul Romer was co-winner along with William Nordhaus, and we'll talk about Nordhaus next week, co-winner of the, of the 2018 uh, Prize in Economic Sciences in Memory of Alfred Nobel. So it's technically not one of the original Nobel Prizes. It isn't always awarded to economists, but primarily it has been there. But there's been at least one historian who's, who's, uh, who's, who's been in the mix there. Um, and you know, the other thing that's kind of a, a funny mind game about all this is that you know, the, the Alfred Nobel wealth that, that was generated and that funded all these prizes now that have been around for, for quite some time was all uh, driven from uh, a technological breakthrough in, in marketing, it was gunpowder. And the, and the deep remorse, I think, in some sense, of having contributed this, you know, killing technology to humans um, and trying to figure out a way to make up for that in some sense. So there's Michael Kramer. We'll talk more about him in a second. Uh, and a basic story here is about population fueling knowledge production. So not just the production of capital, like we see in the solo model as being important, but also production of knowledge and ideas. And an obvious mechanism here is, is something that would look a lot like the solo model. Uh, a fraction of labor that is saved into knowledge production. Just like in the solo model, there's income that's saved into capital production. Labor that's saved into knowledge production, you could call them scientists. Um, and that then produces ideas which are the fuel uh, that actually breaks you out of, of decreasing or constant returns, gets you increasing returns and a breakout from all this. So usually the way these things look is that new ideas are a function of old ideas and la labor that, looks, that, that are scientists, right? People that actually don't spend their time either producing food or producing other industrial goods. They're in the business of producing ideas. Now, it, it, it's also the case that one needn't take such an extreme view of, of idea production here. It doesn't have to be, you know, scientists who, who just, you know, sit in the lab or something or, uh, you know, and write Greek math letters all the time or whatever it is. It could actually be uh, entrepreneurs who are coming up with solutions to things and that are marketable. That's also true. Uh, but it's useful, I think, to view it this way because, especially today, a lot of the new innovations seem to be coming out of places like labs with uh, some private and also a, a fair amount of government funding. Uh, 
um, to, to basically spend their time uh, with trying to come up with new ideas. Uh, there was a, a headline some years ago about just how expensive it was to come up with a, a new molecular or a new chemical entity if you're in the field of molecular biology, a, a, new, a new drug, uh, millions, millions of dollars. <laughs> just a huge amount of, of money that gets poured into, uh, into drug uh, research. And it might not pan out. Uh, that's the other thing. It's a huge amount of risk. So uh, in the Nobel lecture, and here's the link. I'm, I'm not going to show it in class, but you're welcome to have a look. Uh, I, I found it very stirring. But at the same time, you know, uh, I'm 46 years old. I'm used to listening to economists for, you know, 25 years. I don't know if you guys would find it quite as stirring as I did. So I thought, well, you know, let, let's summarize the salient points here. Uh, I, I think it's a great listen if, if you care to watch it. It's on YouTube. Uh, and there's, there are shout outs to Chad Jones. So Chad is at Stanford now, but he used to be here at Berkeley. Uh, and in Berkeley, Berkeley's Ron Lee. So Ron used to teach this course. And 20 years ago, I was his GSI, sitting in this room as he taught this course and talked this topic. And Michael Creamer, who was, again, it was the Nobel Prize winner in, in 2019, along with Esther Duflo and, and Abhijit Banerjee. So at minute 27 is a nice summary, summary of, this, of this point. There's a huge advantage to doubling the number of people who can contribute to the production idea of ideas from which we all benefit. Um, and I have several slides here about Paul Romer, but one of the favorite things I have to say about him is that he went to Burning Man. <laughs> so there are enough chuckles that a few of you know what Burning Man is. <laughs> And so those of you who do, please tell everybody else what, what it is. You can talk about it on a piazza or something like that. But Bur <laughs> Burning Man, is, so if you don't know what Burning Man is, Burning Man is sort of the quintessentially now 21st century hippie retreat, if you will. I don't, I don't mean that in a derogatory sense at all. I, I love hippies. We're all hippies at heart. You know, what, what's a hippie? Well, it's somebody who believes in free everything. And, you know, there's no currency, right? There's no money at Burning Man. You share things. You trade, you know, you, and you also bring this amazing art. And you might also not wear very many clothes because it's in Nevada and, and people are into that. So, so Burning Man is this hilarious thing. The reason that Paul Romer went to Burning Man is he is really into cities. And so if you've ever been to Burning Man, you know that starting in the early part of this millennium or maybe the last end of the last millennium, there was a fair amount of thought given to how Burning Man is actually built. Each and every year they build the thing again and take it down. And of course, there, there is the, literally a burning man at the end of it. It's a big wooden thing that they burn in this sort of crazy pagan thing, right? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's all fun. It's just fun. People go there on vacation. It's all it is. It's, it's fun. But, but so Paul, Paul Romer goes to Burning Man. There's this article in the New York Times all about it. So cities are really his thing. Let me just pause and come back to that in a second. The, the thing that this really cool, and then he gives a shout out to at about minute 23, is Michael Kramer's work on this, uh, which was published in 93, so it was around, you know, the turn, 1990 was probably when he was writing it, or possibly earlier. And he also gives a shout out to, to Ron Lee and to Chad Jones, who were working on, on this kind of stuff back then. And what he talks about is something that's very near and dear to modern economics, which is the, the idea of a natural experiment. And when you use an, a natural experiment, or you look for one, you typically want something that is uh, a, a process that's totally exogenous to everything else that's happening. Climate is a pretty good one, or, or weather, like a natural disaster, like an earthquake or a hurricane. I mean, these are all awful things, of course. Here, if you think about the, the end of the last ice age, which was right before the Neolithic or agricultural revolution began, the story is that the continents were roughly where they are now. There's a little bit of movement. Of course, so all of us in California are aware of this, that the plates actually do move a little bit. <laughs> and it can be a little scary sometimes. Um, so humans had migrated across land bridges during the Ice Age because the, the ocean levels were much lower because more of the water was in the form of ice, especially at the poles, but elsewhere. And so humans had actually migrated across land bridges. So the, the thinking has been that humanity... Homo sapiens originated in Africa and gradually populated all the other parts of, of the globe. Um, and they did it through these land bridges. They didn't have ship technology back then. So between that period and the, say, 1500s, which is when the Renaissance in Europe finally, magically, strangely, created this technology. And of course, it's not magic or strange at all. It's a story about population 
uh, pushing technology. Um, so the result was in the 1500s, uh, you know, Columbus and all these other, you know, tragically oppressive folks, I guess, you know, ultimately, but it's part of history now. Um, with their great ship technology sailing across the Atlantic, sailing to other parts of the globe, and finally reconnecting them, where, whereas they had been disconnected for all these many years. So that is a very, very lengthy experiment, if you like to think of it that way, where there, there kind of is no control group, but the, the treatment groups are all these different groups that have different sizes of population on their continent that are isolated from the others because they cannot reach each other anymore. And the, the thought experiment then was, well, what did you see in terms of human populations after all of that? And the answer was that it, it appears the those with the more uh, population to begin with did better overall at the end by the end of it. So they those with more population to start ended up with more population at the end through the technological change that actually increased the supporting uh, the, the carrying capacity basically of the land. So it was a uh, you know, consistent with this theory, it's it's not a particularly ironclad, uh, you know, experiment. <laughs> you could you could I think say a whole bunch of things about it, but the point is that the population had grown the most in in the place where it had been the largest uh, to begin with, uh, Eurasia and Africa, and of course that's a pretty big area, but it's it's not Australia, and it's also not so much the Americas. Okay, so getting back into things like, like cities, uh, and I think this might be compelling to folks as well, and maybe a little bit more uh, down to earth. Uh, yeah, Roma talks about a lot of things, so we're going to talk about another thing, even again here on the next slide, but, but cities. Cities matter, uh, and the design of cities matter, and this was a remarkable thing that he said, which I was unaware of, but now that I think of it, it doesn't strike me as too surprising. The next century from now, we will see humans build more cities, more urbanization than we have seen in the period since the Neolithic Revolution, which is, is quite staggering when you think about it. Um, and, and those of you who, are, who are, were born abroad may have seen more of this in real time than I ever have. I've lived in the United States my whole, my whole life. Around here we see some changes, uh, but not quite the same amount of, of change that is happening in many parts of the developing world. And what he says, what Romer says about this, is that the design of cities really matters here. If you lay out the space in a way that is conducive to getting people around, whether it's by mass transit or something else, getting people to uh, other places and able to talk to other people, then you're in great shape. If you wait, it's usually very costly and very rarely done. Uh, and an exception of uh, in where it was done was the city of Paris, which was radically redesigned under a, a person named Hausman, I think an architect, uh, and it upended a lot. So it was very controversial at the time. We, I, I think most of us who are not French and not Parisians have no knowledge of any of this, but it was not very popular. When you go to visit Paris today, of course, it just seems perfect, but it didn't always look like that. It originally uh, was much more crowded and dense. If you've ever, have you, any of you ever been to London? Parts of London probably strike you as really nuts, right? <laughs> because they are just so smushed together. So I think Paris was a lot more like that originally. And now it's got these grand boulevards. It's got this amazing subway system. Uh, you know, New York City is a great subway system as well. But the one thing that we don't have in the Bay Area is a particularly good subway system, right? I mean, BART will get you there, but it's, you know, uh, and, and folks are still trying to, I guess, tunnel through uh, into Fisherman's Wharf, whatever that's called, the extension that might do that at some point. Um, another thing, so, so urbanization and cities matter, but you know, Paul Romer that also talks about this this very, I think, um, you know, something that really strikes a chord to all of us who are here anyway. Cer certainly myself, I think, I think you'll find something here really to, to take away from this. Uh, scientists matter, and people devoting time to science matters a lot too. Uh, and again, the, you could think about this as, as a, a version of the solo model where You've got labor that's saved into science production. Um, in the first 20 years of the Nobel, he talks about only 3% of the prize winners were, were from the United States, were American in that, in that sense. After World War II, approaching 50%. And, you know, it's, it's a share of world population, so we're definitely you know, hitting above our weight, as one might say, punching above our weight, something like that. It reflected the investments in the university system that began in the 1860s. 
The National Academies of Science were begun by Abraham Lincoln back in the 1860s. And so was the University of California. And the best part about this, now to bring it almost full circle, is if you look at, at, uh, at Sather Gate down there on Sproul Plaza, look at the middle of it, and you'll see the motto, which is Fiat Lux, which means um, let there be light. This is the whole idea. Let there be this light. Um, let there be time spent with ideas and discussion. And of course, that's the great regret I have teaching a class this size. That I, the discussion is the best part, and I think you guys are doing that in section office hours and piazza. Not so much here where I'm just kind of you know doing this, and hopefully some of it isn't boring. This is tough. Uh, but you know, this is part of the whole process. And Romer points out that you know, uh, this began in the 1860s, and it took a long time for all this to pay off. This is a long-term process, but it is absolutely central to, uh, to innovation. So finally, and this is a very tiny type kind of thing, but let me pick out a few, a few things to say. He talks about uh, encouragement. So he says, let me close with encouragement to young people about what a fantastic life can come from science. An encouragement for young economists at a time when the economics profession has gotten a lot more competitive. It's, it's much tougher to start out as a young person than when I was a young person or when Bill Nordhaus, the other winner that year, was a young person. But remember that there's a tremendous opportunity, enormous opportunity in economics to start to explore these broader notions of progress, the broader side of human nature that includes the kinds of things that William Faulkner talked about in his Nobel speech. And of course, William Faulkner was a, a, a writer who won the Nobel Prize for Literature back in 1949. Love and honor, pity and pride, compassion and sacrifice. So Romer talks a lot about this, this uh, compassion and sacrifice and getting along with other people. That's just such a fantastic message. And by that he means you know, the realization that uh, you know, different tribes of humans can really all benefit from the existence of each other, which is something that our distant ancestors back before the Neolithic Revolution could never possibly have imagined was true. All they were doing was surviving locked in struggle usually with other humans. And this is precisely the wrong way to think about it if one were to think about the, the beneficial interactions of people producing ideas and all that. So finally he closes then that, you know, he says, remembers that there's a reason that we call the scientific period of discovery the Enlightenment. Uh, so yes, let there be light. So there's our motto right there, which was just fantastic. It was, you know, UC Berkeley, let, let there be light in daily life. Let there be life too in our spirits and in our souls. To get along with other people and to see that adding rather than subtracting is probably the way to improve everybody's well-being. Uh, to forget about the sort of zero-sum uh, arithmetic of the Malthusian model, to think instead about this, this optimism that you know, he was part of and, and won the Nobel Prize and went for in part. Okay, um, so let me pause there. Questions, yeah. Is, is there evidence of the, the, of the generation of ideas slowing down or stopping? Is, is there evidence of, of, the, of the generation of ideas, of ideas slowing or stopping when we stop investment? You know, uh, it's a really good question, and I, I'm trying to think of, you know, uh, I think, you know, what has been studied are things like the following. Um, the fall of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain after the 1989, fall of the Berlin Wall in 1991 and all that sort of thing made it possible for a lot of Soviet mathematicians to travel and become part of knowledge production in the United States. And I, I, that, that kind of thing really matters a lot. It's, it's hard to find natural experiments of, of sort of starting or stopping investment in these sorts of things. You think about the decrease in state funding in the UC system. Well, that, yeah, I mean, part of the problem with things like that is what's the control group, right? Um, but there's probably a paper in there if you're interested. <laughs> the problem is that if you believe this argument, you might have to wait 50 years to see the effects. Other questions? Okay, so on to an eye clicker question or two in case you missed the first one. If you had a Malthusian view of the U.S. economy, immigration is what? 
good or bad, no net effect, no way to tell. Okay, so let's stop polling in three, two, one. Well, it's kind of a fun, open-ended kind of thing that we can imagine almost no you know, wrong answers to. I think I would go with either B or maybe C. So most people said B, and I think that's probably the best one. You, you could say C if you felt like immigration in a Malthusian economy doesn't actually do anything, really, in the long run. It, it does uh, produce more, more deaths, right, as we would transition back to the sort of, uh, you know, the prevailing uh, equilibrium wage. So I, I think that's right, that probably bad is the view. Um, and so what do we think about this one? If you had a Bozeropian view of the U.S. economy, immigration is what? Okay, so let's close polling in three, two, one. So I think it's it's good, pretty unambiguously, and I think people agreed. Yeah. Uh, if you think more more people are good, or population increases, technology immigration is probably a good thing. Yeah. I, you know, so we'll get into immigration more in the in the second part of the course. I mean, I, I think um, some of the things that are a little bit more subtle in the topic of immigration, and I'm not sure we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. We're talking about it, unfortunately, is are things like brain drain from developing countries. And so, right, one, one is tempted to say, well, you know, the U.S. can be quite lucky being historically an immigrant receiving country, receiving immigrants, who maybe isn't so lucky. It might be the sending countries where especially those who are more able to be mobile and to leave might be the more able people who would help produce ideas in that country. Um, so kind of perhaps the downside of, of immigration then might be that kind of thing. All right, so big pictures. Um, intensification, this is kind of a, an interesting subtle point and it goes along with a lot of what happens in economics is sort of the unexpected. It's not necessarily progress uh, and that'll show up occasionally in the literature. It's not obvious that, that it ever was good to stop uh, being a hunter-gatherer. I mean, it clearly was in terms of producing more people, but in terms of the average living arrangements, it, it didn't seem that that really rose consistently, uh, not until maybe the Industrial Revolution or even after that. So the, the living conditions were not particularly great throughout most of human history, I think. It's just there were much more of us around. But after all, uh, misery loves company. So maybe that is better to have more miserable humans. Kind of a, a true and interesting point. You might wonder, you know, does progress go into raising our living standards or just making more of us? And, and how, how do we talk about, or think about that? Invention does seem to lead to progress, better tools, infrastructure, rising standards of living in the long run, and cumulative generation of, of, of knowledge. So you might imagine that maybe there is an optimal population growth rate that, that kind of balances these things, that maybe there's growth that's too slow, uh, as we historically saw, uh, and again, I didn't spell this out in great detail, but after the, the Ice Age, uh, the development of human populations in places like Australia uh, was not particularly successful. Um, so why exactly that was? A lot of it has to do with the arid nature of that continent. Um, and that's kind of the big unspoken truth here is that geography matters a ton. Having navigable rivers where you can put stuff on boats, they don't have to be very, you know, uh, technologically advanced boats, they can just be rafts. That really helps a lot if you're trying to set up markets and specialization that improves everybody's lives. Uh, maybe you grow too quickly and you're under constant Malthusian pressure, pressure where you don't have much in the way of surpluses to plow back into capital, that could happen. And maybe Europe just happened to somehow be in the sweet spot. Um, and again, there too, the, the geography kind of is the big unspoken thing here. Europe was extraordinarily lucky, and there are other parts of the world too that were very lucky, but Europe was extraordinarily lucky 
in its climate and geography. It had rivers all over the place, navigable rivers all over the place. It had a climate that was very conducive to humans thriving, not conducive to insects biting humans and transmitting diseases. And that, that's kind of one of the big sad stories about the continent of Africa, that there are a heck of a lot of insects uh, biting people and spreading awful diseases all the time uh, down there, and not so much in, in Europe. Uh, so, yeah, let me just give a shout out here too. The, the other big unspoken thing that we've talked about, and so there's a, uh, there's a mention here of Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that talked about not only the climate that favored Europe, but also, you know, so the, just the germs part, but also the steel and the technology and the fact that people had guns. And then lurking here too, I think we should keep in mind, and especially given that this is February and Black History Month, is that there was a, a big cost of uh, the human slave trade that's part of this. There's a reason why Africa was, was, a, was victimized and African Americans were brought forcibly to the United States and also many parts of Central and Southern America. And that also matters. Uh, you know, what we have mentioned here is important, but those sorts of things are also important as well for talking about uh, population change. Next time, uh, we'll talk about population and resources, which is kind of the other big thing. And it also is the other half of the Nobel Prize in 2018, award to William Nordhaus. Thank you. See you next week. Have a great weekend.